of a fairly brief message this morning, which is focused on the crisis that the business community is facing at the moment. I'm sure you are aware of the cries that are coming from that community. They have taken decisions to protest the conditions in which they do business. And my remarks are not so much focused on the challenges that the business community face today as to what needs to be done. Because these challenges are not new, they are not limited to the business community, they are part and parcel of the national crisis that we, some three years ago, characterized as the crisis of failure to thrive in Uganda. The complaints of the business community are mainly focused around high tax regime in the country. And indeed, we have a very, very high tax regime. Uh, and it's a deliberate, it's part of a deliberate policy to cripple enterprise. It's, it's a deliberate. It's a, we have talked about this in many, many campaigns that actually high tax regime does not lead to high revenue for the state. It doesn't. Because when you put up taxes very high, few people buy because prices go high. And so few people buy and so revenue, although the tax on every item is high, the revenue does not correspondingly rise. The revenue actually falls. But you see, we have a system that is not intended for the improvement of the common lot. The partnership in business in Uganda, and it's not just in business, maybe even in uh, in in in. Uh, politics that control the country is a partnership between those who control Uganda and foreigners. It's not a partnership with the local people, with the Ugandans. It's in fact a partnership against the Ugandans. And this is what needs to be clear not to just the business community, but to all Ugandans who are suffering. So today, the hardest hit in the business community are the small businesses, small and medium businesses. These are the most highly hit by the uh, tax regime. You find that to import, and this is part of what they are crying about, importation, because a lot of what we use here is still imported, attracts an import duty of 35%. They have to pay VAT 
withholding tax 6%, infrastructure tax, whatever that is, is supposed to do, 5%. And uh, that is just the beginning. As soon as they get into the shops, other taxes pile. And although we say we are part of the East African community, where there should have been harmonization of nearly everything, save for the political federation, in Kenya, VAT up to now is 16%. In Uganda, it is 18%. So you find Ugandans have to compete with those who pay less tax. And uh, that is how uh, you find they get out of business. Now, for businesses like hotels, the other day I was having a chat with our chairman here who is uh, also a hotelier. Hotels pay about 25 different taxes on their one business. You find hotels pay corporation tax 30%, withholding tax 6%, VAT 18%, hotel tax, hotel tax is established per district. Districts are the ones who impose it. Service charge, 5%. Trade union fee, 2,000 per person. Occupation safety, 2 million per star. If you are one star, you pay 2 million. If you are four star, you pay 8 million. Copyright uh, tax for music you play, for films they, they show. Ground rent, trading license restaurant license, bar license, swimming pool license, operations license, liquor license, entertainment license, payee, <laughs> NSSF, and so on and so forth. On the same one business. So this is clearly, I mean, untenable. You kill the chicken that produces the eggs. The second complaint of the traders has been the management, the compliance measures, measures to comply with the taxes. And one of the measures which is currently being complained about is that uh, what they call EFRIS, electronic, uh, EFRIS is the, it's called, or the electronic what? Uh, yes, before invoicing, electronic something invoicing. But the the that EFRIS is about computerized direct taxation going to computerized direct taxation going to revenue from the business that you run. So if you are running a small shop, you have to buy a point of sale machine on which if you make a receipt, the receipt separates the tax for revenue authority and informs Revenue Authority the tax you have collected from this, uh, from this transaction. So first of all, you have to register everything you have in your business into the machine. You must make a register. Whatever is sold from your register is recorded, and tax goes direct to Revenue Authority. If Revenue Authority finds somebody on the street who does not have the EFRIS report 
and they ask him and or her and she says she bought it from this shop then you are liable to a fine of 6 million if you forgot to give a receipt and somebody gets out of the shop without that receipt you pay a fine of 6 million instantly and uh, if you are sub if you haven't registered when you are supposed to have registered on that IFRIS, you pay a fine of 50 million. It's you to determine that I am liable to register. You go and register. If you, are, if you haven't known that you are liable and you are found, you pay 50 million or you go to jail for 10 years. Now, we are dealing, so um, this is why it, it impacts small traders. Because this is a revenue collection activity, but which the trader must invest in, in buying the machine, in carrying out all the registration, and in, indeed in, in harmonizing the accounts that regularly must be remitted to the revenue authority. Most of our small businesses are run by people who haven't even been to school, who don't know any of, of all of this. And the threshold for registration is very low. It's, uh, I, I understand if you are making a sa sales, just if you are making sales of 450,000, then you must register. And you must buy this machine and register everything you are working on and so on and so forth. Now, secondly, this machine uses internet, so you must have internet. And the internet must be good internet connection, because otherwise it is too slow. If you have many people buying, you will not sell to them, because you cannot produce the receipts at the speed which they want. So all these are just roadblocks that uh, make it impossible for small businesses to function. Because you are increasing their overheads, they must employ more staff to register all these items, to do all these things. Uh, it's simply not, uh, not tenable. The other complaint on the IFRIS is that most of the importers here we have are small importers again. They combine their merchandise into one container and clear the container together and separate their merchandise to the different buyers. Now that is not allowed. Every trader, so every trader must clear their items on their TIN number. So if you have 20 traders in a container, you, before you pay tax, you must separate the items to the 20 traders, and every trader must clear their own item under their own TIN, tax identification number. This is extremely time consuming. It's costly because each one must now have a clearing agent and so on and so forth. And uh, again, for small businesses, they simply cannot, cannot uh, survive. And then of course, there is also in the compliance process. Somebody goes through all that pays taxes, when they are getting out, the Bureau of Standards also arrests them, says we have to check the standards. But if you wanted to check standards, you should check them even before taxes are paid. Because what, what happens if you find that commodities are substandard? When they have already paid the tax, do you get tax refund? Do you get... And so all these are the things that, uh, that cause problems to the traders. And of course, 
it's not all that pass through this chaos. There are those who don't pay any taxes. So some people pay taxes, others are exempt. And they are in the same market competing. And I'm sure you know those who, get, who will get exempt. They will either be foreigners or the usual suspects from the royal family or those who have linkages with the royal family. <laughs> those are the ones who will not pay taxes and force the other ones who pay taxes out of business. The other major complaint which is valid from the traders is that the manufacturers, and these are generally or mostly foreign, Chinese, Indians, and so on, who are the manufacturers, who are given tax holidays because they are investors and sometimes free land. They now take their merchandise and also retail it themselves. They, they, they are manufacturers, they are wholesalers, they are retailers, all at the same time, the same people. So wh what happens to you, the poor, small Ugandans? Means they have been condemned out of business, you know? And so who, who protects? It's like we are in a country that has no, simply no protection for ordinary folks, you know? So these are very, very legitimate concerns. Of course, the other concern they have, which is legitimate, is the cost of loans, the cost of money. Because most businesses are run on, on, on credit, on, on loans. And the interest rates are simply atrocious. The people they are competing with in the market, the foreigners, borrow at between 1% and 4%. The interest rates in China, in Europe, in Japan, they are between actually zero. Some, some countries have zero interest rates to about 4%. Ours start around 18%. Go on up to 30%. And of course, if you go to money lenders, that's a different story. But in the banks, you know. And what causes the high interest rates in Uganda? The biggest culprit is the same government. Because the biggest borrower, domestic borrower here, is government. The budget you hear them talking about is half borrowed from our banks where this trader is also supposed to borrow from. And the banks will not lend to many small borrowers. They would rather lend to one borrower, it's cheaper, rather than collecting from so many, you are collecting from one, and the government uh, is generally treated as a safe borrower because they give you a check when it should mature, you just go and collect your, your money. So banks are not lending to business. They are lending to government. The little money that remains is what business fights over and the taxes are very high. The one complaint which is also, of course, amongst the business community is that even when they pass through all that and they supply to government entities, whether central government or local governments, they are not paid. <laughs> you know, the domestic areas, people who have been thrown out of business by government, 
because they supplied to government, you can't count them. You know? The domestic debt of Uganda now is close to 45 trillion. The amount of money that government owes to people within Uganda, not foreign debt, local debt, is about 45, 44 point something trillion. And they supply thinking they are going to be paid next month. Then they say there was no release from finance. It goes on years and so on. And this man who had borrowed in any case from the bank to get money to supply, the bank sells his property, and uh, that one goes back to the village. Uh, of course, most of the business community problems intensified due to COVID. You must have seen that other countries gave huge incentives, support to business after COVID. Ours didn't. So even though the government was the one ordering closure of businesses, shut down, people had to pay rent for the period they were not working, and no support at all, nothing from government. So they have... They have Capital was already depleted by all these uh, uh, problems. And of course, the list of complaints is endless. That's why I said the problem is not just business. And our business community, this this message is directed to them because they don't get it up to now. My sense is that they don't get it, where their troubles come from and how they will be solved. They don't get it. They had started an activity, then they had a rumor that Mr. Museveni was going to meet them. And they... <laughs> <laughs> they, they said, okay, now, now we are going to get a, a solution. They, they, they abandoned the activity. When they went, they said, ah, we don't know anything about you. Now they are back. <laughs> saying, no, nobody is caring about us, they are back. They are not, you cannot get a solution from the problem itself. How can you... <laughs> The problem is where they are going, where they hope they will get a solution. You can't. They don't get it up to now. The problem for business is the same problem for agriculture. All people who are in the tea industry are now bankrupt. Everyone in the tea industry is bankrupt. Why? because there is no support for the industry. Although it is certainly a big industry, a big gunner for the country, could be a big gunner, no support. Tea is now between 150 and 200 shillings a kilo. So that all of those Toro farms, you are going to find them with bushes very soon. Very, very soon, they will all be forests. Because there is no way anybody can maintain them at that cost. Cotton. Cotton collapsed. There is no more cotton. It, you know, so, another problem actually traders have is that government said they are protecting the local manufacturers. So they, for example, said you cannot import textiles. We want to protect the local textile manufacturers. But there are no local textile manufacturers. Maybe in IT, which still buys the, 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 the literal cotton that is around. 
or others are importing. They are importing textiles and processing them here. Protected by the government against other importers that they are manufacturers. So, you are not supposed uh, to, Im to import textiles. First of all, the, the local manufacturing, even that what they call local manufacturing, produces about 5% of Uganda's needs. And this 5% is also imported. In fact, what they call manufacturers here, they are assemblers. They are not manufacturing anything. Somebody brings a phone, like these phones, he removes the cover and brings covers in different box. He brings the board of the phone in a different box. He brings the glasses in a different box. It is cheaper to transport it that way anyway. They bring here, they, they fix them, say, we are making phones in Uganda. Nonsense. <laughs> and nobody should bring phones because we are, we are making phones. So you get a monopoly for making phones when you are not making any phone. That is, so the monopolies, are monopolies again of those same characters that have caused trouble for Uganda. All those monopolies, you trace them, they will be traceable to the same royal family, all of them. Denying everybody else business, leaving it for just the, the selected people. So if you want to import textile, the tax you pay, because it is protected, you pay tax according to kilos of the textile you have imported, not according to the value. Every kilo, you pay a tax of $3.5 for every kilo. If it is a garment, cloth alone, you pay $3 per kilo. This is huge amount of money that you cannot have. Plus, of course, all the other taxes that I mentioned, VAT, what, 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 not, all the others. So, the point we are making is that this crisis in business will not go away and is not limited to business. It is across the board of the country. Everybody is on the wall. Whether you are a farmer, including even the cattle, cattle keepers, they are on the wall because no Akari side works, no uh, medicines are all fake, and you you end up with the disease problem that we have in the animal industry. Foot and mouth disease, I don't know ECF, I don't know which ones, or uh, crippling the animal industry. So, the crisis is much bigger than just taxes on, on these items. And of course, the businessmen who are, and women who are paying these taxes, just like all Ugandans, are aware that these taxes are not applied for their own services. The taxes are being weighted once they are collected to send people on holidays with tons of money, some to be banked there, some to enjoy. 
while there are no roads, there is no power, there are no health care facilities, the garbage is all over the town, the, you know, and it's the trader to, to remove his own garbage, it is the trader to, 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 to clean his own street. <laughs> so, you know, the fact that taxes are not applied to their to what they are intended. This cannot be resolved by a meeting of businessmen and Mr. Museveni. It will not. So, for business, Ugandan business, to benefit Ugandans, in a meaningful and sustainable way, there has to be a change of the system. It's not so just saying now we are forgiving you this, today we are doing this, you know, this tinkering around the edges. We will not solve these problems. This is why I invite the business community and all other elements of organized groups in our country, whether they are farmers' association, whether they are, uh, you know, uh, entertainment industry, whatever you are engaged in, we all need to link up and change the system. The system must be overhauled completely. A system that depends on a partnership between a family and foreigners. That's the system that controls our country. Partnership between a family and foreigners must end. And it won't end by just having a meeting. We must all unite. We must all take a collective decision together to say enough is enough. So that it's not just businessmen today, tomorrow it is teachers, the other day it is nurses, the other day it is uh, uh, doctors, the other day it is the KCCA staff, the other day, it, it all comes from the same place. So, let businessmen say they will not work with us because we are in politics. No. It is the same politics that is affecting everyone. Let's unite and resolve this. So my message is direct to the business community as it is to all other groups in our country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thank you so much our leader.